Welcome back, I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today we are going to talk about the Reverie Diver. And this is one that actually surprised me a bit. This is one that I saw some early reviews of a while ago, and at the time I thought it looked cool, but I didn't think much about it beyond that. That is until a few months ago, when Reverie contacted me and asked if I wanted to review. At that point, I started to take a closer look at the watch. The watch has this really gorgeous dial, with some great specs. But what really intrigued me is that while this is a 40mm diver, it has a really short lug to lug, like 42.6. And since people are always asking me to look at more smaller divers, I thought this would be a good one to look at. But the watch is much more than that, and there are definitely a few surprises here, including one rather disappointing one. But before we really get into the details, I do need to let you know that Reverie did provide this watch, and they told me to go ahead and keep it when I was done with the review which is why the promotional tag was up at the beginning. Now that said, let's dive in. In terms of size, the Reverie Diver is 40 millimeters wide without and 42.6 millimeters with the crown. And as I already mentioned, it has an extremely short lug to lug of 42.6. It's a very small and compact platform and in a lot of ways reminds me of a mini turtle and especially the case style I saw on the Islander Spork. So this should fit a wide variety of people, but I think it would be especially ideal for those of a slender wrist. This dressier diver is gorgeous to look at, but how it wears on the wrist is even more beautiful. Due to that extremely short lug to lug, the Reverie Diver wears even smaller than that 40mm would suggest. It feels more like a 39, maybe even a 38 on the wrist, and the comfort is even further enhanced by the extreme taper of the bracelet going down to 16 millimeters before the extra long thin clasp. The diver is also relatively thin, sitting at just under 12 millimeters, and that is going from the case back to the flat sapphire with AR. So not only should this fit a wide variety of people, but it should also easily fit under a lot of sleeves and jackets. It's also especially well balanced on the wrist when paired with its bracelet. The diver is a watch, you could easily forget you're wearing it, but you probably won't. As gorgeous as this thing is, you'll just be looking for excuses to look at it on your wrist. Now, rounding out the specs, you also have a 20mm lug width, if you could actually call these lugs, as well as 200 meters of water resistance, a Miyota 9039 movement, and a dual loomed setup with Swiss Superluminova. The case design is one of the more interesting aspects of the diver, as there really aren't any traditional lugs. The case has a very nice smooth flowing curvature feel to it, which is then abruptly cut off at the top and bottom, where you wind up having these really small nooks carved out, and this is where the bracelet and the spring bar sit. And just due to the nature of this, you don't have a traditional fitted end link with the bracelet, rather just a flat bar, which is something that I think would be a negative for a lot of people in most situations, but here it's not something you ever see as it's truly hidden inside that little nook, and this is also true for every other strap you wear with this. So the design is a bit different, and a bit mini turtle-like. Although, as you can see, this isn't a straight tool watch, as the design is dressed up a bit. I think they did a great job creating a balance between the dressier aspects of the case and dial with just the tool watch utility nature of a diver, and they created a watch you could easily wear in a variety of situations. You still have a very nice polished chamfered edge on an otherwise brushed case, but they also went with a brushed steel bezel just to reinforce that there is function here as well as form. As well as that brushed bezel just helps keep your focus on the ornate dial. The bezel is a little small here to get a grip on, but once you do it does have a nice action. It's 120 click, unidirectional, and very minimal backplay. Although, unfortunately with the one they sent me, the alignment of the bezel is just a hair off. Over at the right, there's a rather small crown, which, just like the bezel, can be a little hard to get a hold of at times. But the lack of crown guards on the case, as well as the knurling, does help get a grip. The crown is also signed and screwed down. The lack of crown guards here, as well as a slight curvy flow to the case, also give the diver a slight retro feel. With this green version and the wavy pattern on the center of the dial, I always got a little bit of a 70s vibe from it. Now, turning the watch over, you can also get a glimpse of an exhibition case back. The 9039 movement isn't the most ornate, but the custom rotor is a nice touch. 
For some, the exhibition case back will be a negative, as a lot of people do prefer a closed case back on a diver. In my experience, an exhibition case back always seems to add a little bit of extra thickness. But here it's still 12 millimeters, and that is overall thin, so I don't mind it here at all. Back to the front, we can finally talk and get lost in this dial. This of course is the green dial version, but there are three other options available. In addition to the green, you have blue, gray, and a burgundy option. And one thing I found interesting was that there's no standard black available, which tells me from the get-go they were going for something a little different. When it comes to the dial, there are three different sections. The first of which is a smaller center section with a rather ornate galoche effect, which is easily the most dressy element of the diver. And the way the pattern catches the light is just mesmerizing. Yet, honestly, it can be maybe a little too eye-catching at times. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is flat-out gorgeous. But sometimes I found myself more distracted with the wavy pattern than the hands that are sitting on top of it. Plus, just due to its reflective nature, it can make the watch a bit too reflective at times. And it's also in this center section that you have a small amount of text in a rather small and unobtrusive font. So it's very minimal and just doesn't get in the way. Now, moving further out to the dial, we see that the ornateness is then balanced with a slightly raised platform, which contains the indices. This is in a matching green with a semi-gloss texture, but there's no pattern here. As well as there's a metal framing that's then surrounding each indice, which is then filled with luminous paint. Then, just beyond that, you have a raised chapter ring with white paint for markers, and that does rise to meet the flat crystal. The handset chosen here is a bit unusual, and one of the more interesting aspects. The hands are flat, so there's not a lot of depth here, as well as they're partially skeletonized so they don't cover up that ornate center section. But they're a little wide and extremely polished, which helps them stand out and on their own from the ornate dial underneath. However, as I said, they don't stand out quite as much as I would like. So overall, it's a gorgeous, well-made watch, and one with a design that will easily stand out in a crowd of divers. But now it's time to talk about my first real disappointment here, and that's with the loom. Now, first off, I really like the setup here, where you have blue BGW9 on the hands and a green C3 on the dial. But as good as this watch looks at first, it really lacks any long-term oomph. And this is especially true of the dial and bezel, which last about as long as a Vostok. The only real saving grace here is with the hands, as they stay in it just a bit longer. So overall the loom is okay, but you know at this price, just okay really isn't okay for a diver. And since loom is the only real weak point I've found with this watch, you know realistically if you just needed a nice desk diver, that may not matter to you. Now, it's no secret that I'm a fan of Miyota 9000 series movements, as I think they really hit the sweet spot in terms of price and performance. They are an upgrade over your standard Seiko NH series movements, yet less expensive than your other high beat Swiss alternatives. So in this instance, I think the 9039 is the perfect choice. Especially since the 9039 is a thinner movement, and Reverie took full advantage of that to help keep the diver thin. All right, so let's move on to the bracelet, and I am gonna spend a bit of time here. I gotta say that when I first opened the watch box, I was not expecting a bracelet this good. So the bracelet is one thing that immediately impressed me, and shortly thereafter, kind of disappointed me, but we'll get to that. So I think the bracelet here will look vaguely familiar to a lot of you as it's an all brush single link bracelet, which is complete with an extra long thin clasp, which also has a very smooth on the fly micro adjust system. In fact, I'd say it's so smooth that it almost glides. Now the style of the bracelet perfectly matches that of the watch and is overall a pretty good quality. It has solid links and a milled clasp that is excellent. Although as good as this bracelet is, I was a little disappointed that it was held together by your standard cotter pin instead of screws. However, the finish on the bracelet is great, and as I already mentioned, that extreme taper makes it very comfortable. One interesting aspect is that it doesn't have your standard fitted end links. Rather, it's a flat 20mm bar that is held in there by a quick release pin. 
And just due to the nature of the case and that little nook, that flat bar is completely hidden. So even though there isn't a fitted end link, it still has a nice cohesive look. Now, as the bracelet exits the case, it does flare out to about 22 millimeters. But by doing so, the very edge of the bracelet lines up nicely with that of the case. After that, it then quickly tapers down to 16 millimeters before the clasp. This makes the bracelet extremely comfortable. However, there are a few issues here. The first is a rather minor issue, and that's just that that little spring bar nook is a rather tight fit. So your thicker straps and NATOs just flat out won't work here. But there are a lot of thinner straps that will, and I've shown you three examples. Now, that's just an inconvenience. The real issue here is with the adjustment clasp. Looking at this picture, you can see that the first link of the bracelet is connected to what we'll call an adjustment link. The adjustment link is able to move back and forth along a track underneath the clasp, and then lock into various positions, helping to adjust the bracelet on the fly. When it works, it's a great system. However, here, for whatever reason, the very first link of the bracelet is just a hair too wide to fit inside the clasp. So while the adjustment link can go all the way into the clasp, you can't lock it into place because the first link of the bracelet won't let you. Honestly, I don't know what they were thinking here. It's almost like this was made for something else and they just decided to try to jury rig it to work. Although it's not all bad, you can still use the system, but only about half of the available positions. You can basically have it fully extended and then move it back just to the point where that first link doesn't interfere, which I'd say is probably equivalent to about three micro adjustment holes. So you don't quite have the range you might need if you wanted to put this over a wetsuit, but it is just fine if you're trying to adjust for the heat and humidity throughout the day. So while this is annoying, Overall, I still think this is a great bracelet. It's just a great bracelet with an asterisk next to it. One that points to a very confusing and disappointing aspect to it. Although, what's honestly even more disappointing is that when I looked back to almost a year ago to some of the earlier reviews of the prototypes, a lot of reviewers even mentioned this issue back then. So they knew about it, and it still made its way into production. Now, in terms of value, you're looking at an MSRP here of 490, which I think is a tad high for a watch with Miyota movement. But when you look at everything you're getting here, I think it's still rather reasonable, as it really is a great overall package. Now, with this specific watch, I think it's a little tricky to pick out some other watches to compare it to, as I can't really think of anything that's quite this dressy in quite this small a package. The one that really comes to mind, however, is the Loyart Neptune, which I think is just about the same price. Reverie also gave me a 15% off discount code, and I'll include that down below in the description. But they also said it's only gonna work for the first 10 people that use it. So I'll we'll keep that up there until I hear a word that it's no longer valid. So if you look and it's not there, then I guess it's too late. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, the loom could be a little bit better on this, and the bracelet is amazing, as well as just stupidly disappointing at the exact same time, but overall, it's a pretty good watch, with a flat-out gorgeous-looking dial, not to mention it's pretty comfortable to wear. And while the microbrand diver market is pretty saturated, you know, pun intended, the market for smaller-fitting divers is nowhere near as crowded. So they may be on to something. But what do you guys think of the Reverie Diver? Let me know down below. Is it something you're interested in or is it just a little bit too dressy? And as always, you guys know what to do down below. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time. See you next time.